Freemans will present two important fine art collections, that of Charles and Virginia Bowden, and that of Arnold and Sandy Rifkin. Both collections are important because of the love for American art that they convey. What's also interesting about them is that they each feature a group of artists that were associated with the Ashcan School, which of course begs the question, what is Ashcan and what does it mean? Well, the word ash can, literally a can of ash, was coined in 1913 by an art critic who wanted to ridicule the art of Robert Henry, George Bellows, and William Glackens, and the themes and subjects that they featured. According to him, the paintings that he saw had too many ash cans in them and featured too many girls hitching up their skirts. It's important to remember that the term ash can, though it was coined in the 19-teens, wasn't employed as a kind of descriptive shorthand for these artists' work until the 1930s. And even then it was used largely pejoratively as a counterpoint to the period's full-throated modernism. But ash can, particularly its negative connotation, belies the breadth of these artists' output. And more to the point, it belies the impression these artists had of themselves. They didn't think of themselves negatively, nor did they feel particularly limited by any one mode of painting. Of course, the goal of those artists was very different. They only wanted to reveal and prove that beauty could be found in unexpected places. Most of those artists worked in an urban environment and used the city as their playground. Of course, that doesn't mean that all that they painted were cities. In fact, they focused on the people and especially the working class, which according to those artists, were really the spirit and the energy associated with the town. Yet the artists of the Ashcan School were galvanized by what was in their midst, the dramatic and quotidian of the urban experience, and they created dynamic visual imagery, some of it humorous, some of it sardonic, variably uplifting or depressing, but always poignant. In the subjects they explored, there's a certain expectation for Ashcan images. Urban scenes and above all views of New York's Greenwich Village and the Lower East Side are often what come to mind. A lot of scholars associate Ashkan School with New York City, which is true to an extent, but it's important to remember that the movement itself was born in Philadelphia and is linked with the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia at the time was an industrialist hub and its economy based on coal and iron was skyrocketing. But it was also an important art center and haven for American artists. From individual artists to family legacies, the city was really supporting the arts, especially through its schools, such as PAFA, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, which was created in 1805, the same year as Freeman's, and from which graduated Robert Henry, among others, but Henry being credited as the founder of the Ashkan movement. But Henry, the de facto leader of the Ashkan group, would eventually depart Philadelphia, where he was teaching and painting and he would convince William Glackens, George Lukes, and Everett Shin to join him. And upon their arrival in New York, the group encountered paintable subjects at their fingertips, or I suppose at their brush tips. The city was undergoing rapid transformation at the turn of the 20th century. It was a city of extremes, of people and products, streets and subways, architecture and advertisements. And it was bathed in a glow of electric light and connected by myriad bridges, tunnels, and telephone wires. One common denominator associated with Ashkin artists is really their technique. First and foremost, their quick, rich, and generous impasto, which shouldn't be surprising because many of the artists associated with the group started out as newspaper reporters, which meant that they were trained to capture and record every detail that they noticed in the city very rapidly on the spot. Rapid was also the fate of the Ashkin school because unfortunately, it didn't last long. By 1913, the year of the landmark Armory Show, we consider that American artists at the time had figured out a different, more radical way to be modern. What is fascinating, however, is that even if the movement was short-lived and inspired a new generation of artists, such as Charles Birchfield, or of course, Reginald Marsh, who is forever remembered for his gritty New York City scenes. But inasmuch as Henry would implore his students and Ashcan colleagues to paint what was real, he also promoted freedom in art. He advocated that his students find and follow their own path to develop an individualized aesthetic and encourage them, perhaps above all else, to capture the world as they found it. For the artists that comprise the Bowden and Rifkin collections, Henry's words resonated deeply. Find and follow your path. Commit to an individualized aesthetic and paint the world as it was, whether urban or rural, in a darker, grittier palette or a lighter, more optimistic one, and whether in Philadelphia, New York, or abroad.